Hey all, I mentioned I might do this last week, but while I try to figure out what I, all I need to do to make this the, the shorter videos more visually appealing, I might be pivoting a bit to just rele uh, releasing the full episodes from the podcast, just the timeline in the background for a week or two, maybe longer, I don't know, I don't like to give out uh, kind of timelines. I do think I'm going to make the Ray Davis portion into a video maybe during the weekend, but right now I'm a bit busy between, you know, other things outside of this and trying to put together the best possible free agency show for the podcast on Thursday morning. Uh, appreciate you all, and here we go with episode 11. You're never going to have a crystal ball in the sport. Some people who do this talk like they do or pretend like they have one, but way too much of this sport is random to ever really have that much confidence in what we do. Michael Thomas is my go-to example of this. Four straight 1,100-yard seasons, two straight 1,400-yard seasons, coming off of nearly 150 50 receptions, 1,700 yards, all before turning 27 years old. If I would have offered you a second round rookie pick for Michael Thomas, you would have been enraged, but I would have been doing you a favor. Now, you probably could have gotten a better deal on the market, but my point is that the second round rookie pick has been more valuable than Michael Thomas on expected value since that point. Andrew Luck did have some injuries, but that is a player who retired when many people believed he would have five, even 10 years left at the head of a super flex roster. After all, Andrew Luck would only be turning 35 this year, making him just a bit older than Carr and Gino and younger than several of the older starters in the NFL. My point in saying all this is that we don't know anything in this sport. Sometimes when we get things right, even half our reasons are wrong. Other times we are objectively wrong, but we still believe we supported the right process or that, that maybe things would have been different if the player just, just went to a different place or, or that things were just a little, little different in a different time or in a different, in a different universe where they could have gone to a different location. My point in saying all of this is that on this show, this show being Fantasy For Real and me as the host, CJ For Real, we discuss a lot of things that don't have the best information, like mock drafts, pre-draft scouting, and even future scouting into classes like 2025 and 2026. And it really isn't all that different to me from any aspect of you know football in general. I know why people treat it differently. I know why people think that we have such poor information that it isn't worth talking about. But at the end of the day, this is all entertainment for all of us. And so, you know, is it a waste of time? I don't know. I really don't think so. This game is random. And so while I understand why so many people will ignore these things, I'm going to continue to talk about these things as best as I can, because I think that sets us up for the best possible process in the long haul. And frankly, I think the real waste of time is talking about so many settled players in the NFL that so many other people like to talk about so often. So in that spirit, on today's show, I'm going to share my thoughts on NFL draft rumors, as well as a super flex draft order based on my own mock draft ADP with only selected mock drafters in the industry. There won't be as much NFL on today's show, not that there's a lot in general, because current pro players are going to be a big deal on the later show in this week because of free agency. What I will do on today's show is dig deeper than I have so far on Juco, Temple, Vanderbilt, and Kentucky running back Ray Davis. I've broken down Davis a few times on the ranking shows for three or five minutes because he is such a controversial player, but given that controversy and given how far from consensus I am, and specifically given how few fantasy people are talking about Ray Davis, I felt like it was time to do a focused full segment on Ray Davis. Davis. Before getting into the longer topics of the show, I want to briefly touch upon how quarterback fantasy stats don't necessarily align with the production produced for their wide receivers. Quarterback generation for wide receivers is based on three categories, completions, passing yards, and passing touchdowns. Completions is a stat that quarterbacks get no statistical value whatsoever for, and it's probably the biggest stat that determines how good or bad a quarterback is, particularly for generating PPR value or having a market that can easily generate PPR value for a player. I bring this up because every now and then you'll see somebody, and if you're somebody who said something like this to me recently, don't take any offense to this, but you'll see somebody say something like, I really like Michael Pittman because he's so attached to Anthony Richardson for a long time. And every time I hear that, I'm always like, man, 
to me, that is literally the worst market quarterback that I could have, like in the entire NFL. Like I would choose randomness and nothing over Anthony Richardson, which I, sounds like a horrible dig, but I don't mean to dig him. It's just every single thing that he gets value for as a fantasy quarterback comes from rushing yards and rushing touchdowns. Rushing yards and rushing touchdowns take stats away from the wide receiver position. And again, I again I assume that a lot of people listening to this are kind of no dying it, but I just want to put it all into perspective because, you know, Patrick Mahomes versus Josh Allen. The last three years, Josh Allen has outscored Patrick Mahomes on average. But when you look at the uh, points that they generate as passers, Patrick Mahomes, 432 completions against only 392 for Josh Allen. That's an extra 40 completions. He's had on average 400 more yards per 17 games. So even though there's more rushing yards for Josh Allen, that doesn't matter. Even though there's more rushing touchdowns, that doesn't matter. And their passing touchdowns are right about the same. Patrick Mahomes is a little bit higher, 35.7 compared to 34. But the point here is that Patrick Mahomes generates more stats in the last three years years for his receivers than Josh Allen does. Jared Goff is the ultimate archetype of a player like this. In the last two years, he has 394.5 completions, 4,506.5 yards, and 29.5 touchdowns. That is very close to the same statistical output as Josh Allen. But Jared Goff would never be considered as good of a quarterback as Josh Allen. That's not even getting in to the Lamar Jackson tier. So I just want to put this at the front of the show just as a quick note, because it, again, because it is something that's quick to talk about, because it is something that I'm sure a lot of people are listening to this and going, yeah, that, that should be fairly obvious. But just in case you're somebody who might be new to Dynasty, or just in case you're somebody who doesn't think about numbers, in this capacity, any kind of locked into rushing quarterback situation for a wide receiver is the lowest caliber wide receiver situation you can get in. Being connected to a poor quarterback or an ambiguous future quarterback situation is preferable to being locked into a rushing quarterback and a heavily rushing quarterback as a pass catcher to me from a general perspective of market share. Now, if you have really good chemistry with your quarterback, I'm going to believe that that can happen and be good over you know the course of time i'm not going to completely discount these players my point is from a general perspective from a general uh, projection of marketplaces players like richardson players like jackson i expect them to have the worst marketplaces for their receivers for as long as those receivers are with rushing quarterbacks Before we get into the rest of the show, I'd like to remind everyone who hasn't done so to follow Fantasy For Real on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or whatever podcasting app you use. I appreciate it, and it can mean a great deal to this show. So as I said earlier in the show, I know it is way too early to be making these strong determinations about mock draft or any kind of draft information, really outside of probably Caleb Williams, Marvin Harrison Jr., maybe a little bit of confidence within the top 10. But I also think that we can do these kind of things and have these conversations and spark these conversations and get us in the right position moving forward. I also want to bring up the fact of of why ADP isn't good, because I think too many people attribute it to false or misinformation. And I think false and misinformation is obviously a big part of it, but I also think it might be a more minor part than people believe it is. To begin, even if mock drafts did a perfect job of taking in the consensus of all teams, it would be hard to weigh in how teams would actually draft players because players aren't drafted by the consensus of all teams. Players are almost exclusively drafted by the one or two teams that are highest on that player. Now, obviously, this is less and less true as you get up the draft. The Bears don't necessarily have to be the highest team on Caleb Williams to draft Caleb Williams. But for most times, after, say, the first 10, 15 picks, the team that is drafting a player is probably one of the highest teams in the entire market on the player. So that's the reason why going to a controversial player like Xavier Worthy... I can believe that even 26, 28, 29 teams could even agree with me on the idea that the 40 time isn't that big of a deal. But if three, four, five, six agree that it is a big deal, that's all you need for a first round marketplace. Take the Will Levis situation last year as an example. I do believe that there is some smoke to the idea that if, say, the Atlanta Falcons or anybody else other than the Houston Texans comes and trades up to three and takes Anthony Richardson over the Indianapolis Colts. I do think there's some smoke into the idea that now you have 
two AFC South teams that both want Will Levis. Do I know for a fact that that changes his draft stock? Do I know for a fact that he gets drafted highly because of that? No, I do not. But I'll tell you something. If two divisional teams do want the same quarterback, I think there's a really good chance Will Levis not only goes in the first round, but goes way, way higher than he went. I do think there's a real logic in the idea that maybe the Colts would have ended up, say, with Will Levis. Maybe not even at four, but at a first round draft capital, because that's how these things can change when only two or three teams are in on a player. When that number goes down to one, all of a sudden that player's market changes dramatically. That's what's kind of happening with my favorite team right now, the Bears, with Justin Fields. It seems more and more that there aren't competing bidders for Justin Fields and the Bears are really worried about the price they're getting in return. But to me, the benefit of this exercise is to look at some rumors, to look over my sharper ADP and to try to determine what is true, what is not, so that we know the best information we have going into the draft so we're most prepared for our drafts when they come and also to compare the information we have, right? For me, as someone who ranks I feel, and I don't know if other people will relate to this because I know that not many people do that, but to me, there's something different about actually drafting a player for your actual team than anything else. And the only thing that's ever come close to it to me is not mocks. It's pushing the publish button on anything I ever do. Because once I push the publish button, I have now declared that ranking as something that goes alongside, you know, my, my name and stuff. So that is Part of the benefit for me, I think it helps me see these things and get the best possible rankings out by the time the draft comes around, which on that note, I still do plan on doing a post day two show that should be out Saturday morning while day three is getting started. So I'm going to go through some market rumors about Drake May, Xavier Worthy, and JJ McCarthy. After that, I'll talk about some market trends with Troy Franklin and Brock Bowers. I will also go through the data overall more completely and then make a super flex ADP afterward. So first, is the fall of Drake May real? My answer to this is kind of yes and no, depending on what you mean by real. I do believe there is a significant chance that Jaden Daniels will be the number two pick. So if you consider that a fall, I do think based on this ADP, every answer here is going to be based on this sharp ADP, based on looking at only specific analysts mock drafts. So based on my sharp ADP, I do think there is a chance that Drake May will fall to number three with Jaden Daniels moving up to number two. But I have not had one single one of the mock drafts that I look at have Drake May falling any lower than number three. So with Drake May still at number two or number three in every single mock draft, I'm mostly considering the fall of Drake May to be fiction, at least at this point, by my estimation of rumors. Number two, and potentially a controversial one because of where I feel about him personally as a player, but is Xavier Worthy a first round lock after the combine? To me, this is fiction, though I do think it is likely he goes in the first round. It's also important to note that on my mock drafts, just by the numbers themselves, he is nowhere near where I would usually consider somebody a first round lock the highest drafted position in any of the mock drafts i look at was 31st now he was 31st or 32nd primarily 32nd on every single one of the mocks so he was in the first round almost every single time but 31st as a highest drafted pick is not high enough for me to on my mock draft adp consider somebody a first round lock based on what these people who are in the know are projecting at this time. Now, what I will say is that one of the things that I personally use to project draft capital outside of some of the numbers is just the concept of scarcity. When a team or when a general manager thinks that they want one specific thing and one player has it more than anybody else, it creates a feeling of scarcity and a reality of scarcity and Xavier worthy by running a four two one became the only person to have a certain thing. If you wanted to buy a certain thing at the combine and by running a four, four one Troy Franklin also did not help his case that he's as good of a deep threat as Xavier worthy though. Personally, I think he is a better deep threat than Xavier worthy, but that is a conversation for a different podcast. The point being, I do believe Xavier worthy because of scarcity, 
goes in the first round. But is it a lock? I am not considering it a lock because the highest ranked ADP that I have, or the highest ranked mock draft position that I have for Xavier Worthy is 31st. Number three, is J.J. McCarthy a top 10, a top 12 pick? And a lot of people are going to know my response based on the podcast I did on J.J. McCarthy. And the answer is yes to me. It's a clear and obvious yes to me. Now, look, I completely understand that we have believed certain things about Will Levis and Malik Willis. The difference is J.J. McCarthy is an actually good quarterback prospect. I'm not saying he's a great quarterback prospect. I'm not saying he should go top three. I'm not saying he won't be overdrafted. But none of the other guys, in my estimation, deserve to even go in the first round. Maybe Will Levis on a pure projection on or on a pure just we need to pick 32 players in this first round and we don't have 32 first round picks. But J.J. McCarthy to me is a player who genuinely deserves to go in the first round. So yes, I do believe there's going to be hype on top of it. But when you look at the age, when you look at the youth progression, when you look at the developmental tools, I think there's almost no chance J.J. McCarthy slips outside of the top 10 or 12 picks. And that is supported by this ADP where he is not lower than the 12th pick on any single draft. And then the fourth slash fifth ones I want to talk about, Troy Franklin falling out of the first round. More of just an honorable mention. Troy Franklin is falling out of the first round. There was a little bit of late push before the combine to get Troy Franklin in the first round. It seemed like he was mostly out of the first round. It seemed like he was starting to enter the first round a little bit before the combine. And then since the combine, he has fallen out. There's not a single mock draft that I have on my list that has Troy Franklin in the first round and the multi-round mock drafts do not have him in the top 50 picks. So that's a very scary thing for people who like Troy Franklin, myself included. And then Brock Bowers, just not a big deal, but Earlier in the, you know, this is just come kind of more of a trend, an honorable mention trend. Brock Bowers early on in this sharp ADP was in the top 10 very consistently. Now he is almost never in the top 10, though he is never falling out of the top 20 as well. And I do think this is, you know, as we get closer and closer to the draft, these kind of sharp ADP things, these kind of mock draft based things are going to get a little bit better and a little bit closer. Again, still not going to be good, still not going to be great, but they're going to be a little bit better. And I do think we're getting Brock Bowers a lot closer to his real range. Again, Maybe the Chargers take him at five, but I think he's a lot closer to his real range at this point. So for the full ADP, Caleb Williams is the number one, and it is a unanimous number one. Every single mock draft has Jaden Daniels and Drake May at two and three. I actually still do have Drake May higher on the ADP number at 2.3 against Daniels at 2.7. I have Marvin Harrison Jr. at four unanimously, and then Odunze and Neighbors are between five and nine in every draft. Odunze is slightly higher at 6.2, whereas Neighbors is at seven on the ADP. I have J.J. McCarthy at 9.7, Brock Bowers at 14.3. The last unanimous first-round pick is Brian Thomas Jr. still. He has been the last unanimous first-round pick for a long time. But after the combine, there is still no more new unanimous first round picks because at least Worthy and Mitchell are outside of at least one first round. I have Mitchell at 30 and a half, slightly better than Worthy, who is at 31.8. Now, the difference that, that those numbers don't actually align perfectly because Mitchell has a ranking from that that's beyond 32 and the ranking for Worthy is just an NR because it was a draft that didn't go for multiple rounds. So Mitchell's numbers, I think, are better than they're leading on there because, again, Worthy's top drafted position is in 31. Mitchell has been drafted in the top 30 on several of my mock drafts. So Mitchell's, I think, quite a bit over Worthy at this point, though, because... I think Brian Thomas Jr. is more and more becoming this consensus wide receiver for, not just because people are saying it, but because for for this process, he has been in the first round and the only guy in every first round in basically every single mock draft I have looked at since the beginning of doing this, other than the top three. There's been the top three and Brian Thomas Jr. in every single mock draft I have done since I've been doing this. So, I mean, this isn't like rocket science. This isn't like something that anybody would, you know, say that is hard to bet on. This isn't something that Vegas would give you good odds on. Everyone's expecting Brian Thomas Jr. to go in the first round, but the, you know, the ADP here backs it up and does say that Mitchell and Worthy are at least slightly less likely. The interesting thing about how this is kind of solidified here is that I think a lot of people were expecting 
after the combine to see a lot more wide receivers in the first round. And it almost feels like the reaction, at least from mock drafters has been more to bump up other positions and say, okay, teams are going to be more comfortable getting wide receivers on day two. And maybe that is the reaction, but I say that just because outside of those six wide receivers, there is no wide receiver anymore that shows up on multiple of my first rounds, including Xavier Leggett, Keon Coleman, and Lad McConkey. Those are three players who show up on one first round, but they do not show up on multiple first rounds and no other player shows up on a first round at the wide receiver position. Bo Nix and Michael Penix Jr. do both show up on one first round as well. So again, that's just one first round. That's not a huge deal. But I, I do think one of these guys could slip into the back of the first round in terms of Bo Nix and Michael Penix. I think both of them could slip into the back end of the first round in Bo Nix and Michael Penix. But that is mostly the numbers of what I have for this sharp ADP that I try to work on. So what are my super flex rankings based on this? I think we have six players really, really clearly right now for super flex leagues between Caleb Williams, Marvin Harrison, Jr. Drake may Jaden Daniels, Malik neighbors and Roma Dunze that they're going to score so highly analytically, so highly in draft capital, so highly on film grades that if you picked any of those six, I really wouldn't fault you too much for it. Now, if you pick, Roma Dunze 101 I would probably fault you for playing the market poorly but in general analytically from a you know just from an understanding that we spent so much time last offseason saying that B. John Robinson shouldn't be considered to be a running back two compared to Jameer Gibbs and I still agree with that from a prospect standpoint but that's kind of the point Jameer Gibbs comes out and all of a sudden a lot of people are saying they're you know basically the exact same and that can happen just here. We're gonna we could spend the entire, you know, ten month period, twelve month period leading up to this draft saying Marvin Harrison Jr. is better, Caleb Williams is better, Marvin Harrison Jr. is better, and all of a sudden one year from now we're talking about how the number two is better in the class. And you know, just because CJ Stroud was the number two quarterback doesn't mean that you want the number two quarterback in this draft class. But it also doesn't mean that you want to ignore the number two quarterback. It doesn't also mean that it can't happen again. It doesn't mean that it can't happen to the third or fourth quarterback being the best. So at the end of the day, anybody who hits highly enough in analytics, in traits, in draft capital to deserve a 101 pick from me is okay, A-OK on my book going in the 101. And this draft is a rare case where we have six of them because we have three wide receivers being drafted so highly and three quarterbacks being drafted so highly. But again, that is the order that I would go in, the order that I said them in originally. Caleb Williams, Marvin Harrison Jr. And then for me, that's when the quarterback need really kicks in. And I say, okay, I need to put quarterbacks highly in a 12-team super flex because of how many that you need because of how many need to be started because of how they retain retain value. So Drake may Jaden Daniels, and then Malik neighbors, Roma Dunze wrapping out the top six. If JJ McCarthy goes top 12, he is easily over Brock Bowers to me. He's probably going to get drafted over Brock Bowers at this point, just in general. And so if Brock Bowers or rather if JJ McCarthy gets drafted over Brock Bowers, JJ McCarthy is going to be my seven Brock Bowers, going to be my eight right now i would have mitchell nine thomas 10 and worthy 11 on this list of the 11 players that are consensus going at or near the first round and mitchell and thomas would be in a clear tier difference from worthy now i've said a lot of things about what i don't like about xavier worthy and i don't want this section to come off as a worthy bashing segment my only point in using worthy is that by being the lowest player on my board, what I'm asking myself with the rest of these players is how do they pass Xavier Worthy in draft capital? So for example, at the quarterback position, what would Bo Nix and Michael Penix Jr. need to do to pass Xavier Worthy? And because I'm not super high on Xavier Worthy, they would probably just need to be drafted in the first round or in the high second round with a clear path to play. And usually when you're drafted in the high second round, you have a clear path to play. Now, passing Mitchell or Thomas would be quite a bit harder for Penix and Knicks, and I honestly don't know if there's anything they could do to get over Mitchell or Thomas in the situation where Mitchell or Thomas gets first-round draft capital. 
In terms of the running back position, in order to pass save your worthy, any of my top six running backs drafted in the top 75 to 80 picks would automatically pass save your worthy. My top six running backs are Trey Benson, Jonathan Brooks, Jalen Wright, Ray Davis, Marshawn Lloyd, and Blake Corum. So top 75 to top 80 might not sound very competitive with a back half of the first round pick, but at the end of the day, that's how the draft capital ranges more so line up, in my opinion, with the differences in position. So if it is a player that I like a good bit that's getting drafted in the semi-high day two range in those top 75, those top 80 picks, those players are players that I am going to be taking over Xavier Worthy, and any running back drafted in the top 55 will go over Xavier Worthy. In terms of passing Mitchell, any running back, in my top three drafted in the top 55 will pass Mitchell. So if Benson Brooks, right. If one of these guys gets drafted in the top 55 in the top 60 picks, that will put them all the way up into my number nine spot, maybe probably even above Bowers into my number eight spot. They probably won't get over McCarthy, but they'll probably be in the exact same tier as McCarthy and Bowers. Again, that's if one of my top three running backs gets taken with a top 55 pick. Now, Keon Coleman, Xavier Leggett, Ladd McConkey, these are the three players that went in one first round. And Keon Coleman in particular, if he was drafted in the top 50, I still have a better grade on Keon Coleman than Xavier Worthy. So going in the top 50 would still allow me to put Keon Coleman over Xavier Worthy if Xavier Worthy is a back end of the first round pick, which is what I'm projecting in this exercise. Xavier Leggett and Lad McConkie are both members of my current top 15, but I don't like them enough to push them over Xavier Worthy necessarily if they do not get good draft capital or equal draft, draft capital with, say, a better landing spot. Troy Franklin, Roman Wilson, Jalen Polk, Malachi Corley, Malik Washington, Ricky Pearsall. These are the rest of the wide receivers that I have ranked in my top 15 that have not been discussed because they are not in any first round anymore. Most of these players will not be able to pass Xavier Worthy, but some of them could pass Xavier Worthy, even if Xavier Worthy is a first round pick, particularly any of these guys who are in the top 50 will be valued around the same range as Xavier Worthy. But again, I don't expect that to happen with too many of them at this point. Obviously, there's an extent to which there's not going to be 12 wide receivers in the top 50, most likely, although that did pretty much happen two years ago. And then at the tight end position, I am a JT Sanders shareholder in my main Debbie league, but I do not currently value JT Sanders over any of my top 15 wide receivers, assuming all of these players get draft capital. So there's really nothing to talk about at tight end. I am not the highest on Xavier worthy, but there's really nothing that JT Sanders can do to pass Xavier worthy. So again, conversations like this make it so that you might not need to hear what I have to say about the rankings right away, but I am planning on doing an instant reaction show as soon as day two ends. So as soon as day two ends, I'm going to start recording Friday night and then before Saturday morning, I'm hoping to post on the draft weekend the uh, instant reaction to the first two days of the draft, which should rank most of the relevant players that you're going to be drafting in your fantasy leagues. So if you want my most up-to-date thoughts, they should be available at almost any time up and to and through the draft. I'd like to remind everyone who hasn't done so to follow Fantasy For Real on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you haven't noticed yet on this show, as so many of us do in life, I often start saying I don't like to do something on this show right before I start to do that thing. The reason I don't really like to talk about personal backgrounds is that I don't think it matters too much. Now, if I were scouting high school kids, it would matter a lot more to me. If I was working for a college and I had to tell them who to bring in for their university, it would matter a lot more to me. But to me, by the time we get to the NFL level, we have so many things to talk about outside of someone's background, outside of someone's father, outside of Marvin Harrison Jr. and Brendan Rice's fathers, that I would rather just consider those things redundant and talk about the on-field things. Because ultimately, if I want to make a point about Marvin Harrison Jr. that relates to Marvin Harrison, I should be able to make it with on-field things without even bringing up his father at all. 
right? I should be able to say he does very good things without having to say, well, he does them like Marvin Harrison. I shouldn't have to say that. So I don't really love to talk about background things. Ray Davis's background is important because it is about how he got his start. It is about how our beliefs about early production, as good as they are and as important as they are, need to always be taken into context of what a player's backstory might be. A lot of the early details, and I'm going to go through them very quickly because I don't want to spend too much time on them, are going to be from a Zach Kiefer article in The Athletic. Ray Davis was born one of 15 siblings and to two parents who were incarcerated off and on. He was awarded the state at eight and was in a homeless shelter at 12 years old. I don't want to linger on the situation too much, but the entire point of getting into this opening is that his reasons for landing in Juco were fairly reasonable. So Ray Davis doesn't get a high recruiting profile coming out of high school and goes to junior college. He does very well as a running back or presumably as a running back or in some way gets the attention of of Temple. I don't really look up the junior college stats very often. So he goes to Temple in 2019 and he breaks out immediately in the backfield, right? For all the conversations that we have about old man Ray Davis and how this guy's going to come into the NFL at such an old age. At 19 years old, he had 15 for 92 against Maryland on a Temple team that did not have as much you know, around him. He had 30 carries for 147 yards and two touchdowns in their other game against the Power 5 Conference against Georgia Tech. And this was, again, all before turning 20 years old. Now, again, that also makes it 2019. That was a long time ago. But the point is that Ray Davis wasn't a bad football player when we first got to see him. And we first got to see him at 19 years old. So it's not just like he's this guy who couldn't beat anybody and then he got old and he got big and then he was able to finally beat up on 19 or 20 year old kids. No, at 19 years old, he was doing extremely impressive things against teams that were better suited to do impressive things than his own Temple team. Another topic I love talking about on this show is how devastating COVID was specifically to the football world, which obviously there's other things going on, but we're talking in this show about how devastating it was to things like developmental schedules. And while the minor conferences in general did not have a very good time with COVID or scheduling things with COVID, Temple in particular had a disastrous season in 2020. There was a Chris Vanini article on The Athletic, didn't try to make him from the same source, just found him when I was searching for him, called Temple's 2020 season was a week-to-week -week struggle. Was it worth it? This is a team that did not play until October, and after so many things went wrong for the team, you know they didn't know how eligibility rules were going to work for the next year. They didn't know if they were going to lose eligibility for playing on this Temple team, so they ultimately decided a good number of the players to opt out and prepare for transfers. Now, I don't know if Ray Davis was injured or if he just opted out and prepared for transferring, but the bottom line is that in 2020, his season basically got erased by COVID-19. 2021, he comes in key year, 21 years old, going to turn 22 years old in the season. This is a big key year where he can leave and still be a relatively young running back, or at least to some extent. He's playing at Vanderbilt. He's playing in the SEC. And in the third game of the season, he suffers a torn toe ligament, which is a little bit of a different one, but the toe ligament takes him out for the rest of the 2021 season, and he does virtually nothing in the season. Then in 2022 and 2023, he is outstanding, and he is outstanding for two teams that are very, very hard to be outstanding for. Between 2019 and 2023, when you take out the year that Ray Davis played in, Vanderbilt is 7-38. and 38. With the year that Ray Davis played in, he was five and seven that year. Now, five and seven is not great, but when you're considering that compared to a four or five year sample of going seven and 38, that's a big difference. Since 2019, the second best Vanderbilt record is three and nine, and the two SEC wins were the most that Vanderbilt's had in this stretch as well. They dismantled Florida and Kentucky, and Ray Davis was the main player to do it in both games with 26, 129, and one, and 30, and 122, and one in the other. 
He then basically does the same thing for Kentucky. Now, people underrate the crap out of the Kentucky program when they just watch it casually. It's not a great football program, but if you think they get blown out every year like Vanderbilt does, you clearly haven't been paying attention to the Mark Stoops era. But even within the Mark Stoops era, Ray Davis is a shining light of running back success on this team. And he dominated the backfield in both teams for both teams and without any backup running backs having much success at all behind them. While doing this, he also accumulated over 60 receptions, showing a consistent knack for catching the ball, turning up field, and also being able to break a tackle while doing so, which leads me to the traits themselves. Because usually I don't spend this much time talking about analytical sides of running backs because I believe it is a traits driven position. But at the end of the day, when a player has production, a production profile that is so bad, like Ray Davis is because of the age that is being so fundamentally dismissed by so many people because of the age, you have to talk about it for a little bit. But in terms of the traits themselves, they're not elite traits, but he is very athletic and he has a nice blend of traits. He has a very nice BMI. He ran a low 4.5, 4 4.52, I believe was the official. He has very solid power and he keeps that low center of gravity, which really helps him with that power. He has that natural pass catching that we were just talking about. And he's a really good natural lateral mover who has a really nice running pace, who can really vary himself very well to adjust and help him with some of those things like his power and like his ability to make people miss on the outside so he's not a perfect running back he doesn't have the upside traits that you really look for but in a class like this where we're just looking for some really good guys he's one of the best box checkers to me for everything other than the fact that he's turning 25 in november and on that note of turning 25 in november i just feel fundamentally like longevity at the running back position is very overrated in terms of just the number itself yes the number matters but the fact of the matter is when the whole market moves around a number and is scared of a number you just have to take it for what it is and sometimes say you know this might be a buying opportunity I don't like to target older players, but if every single person who dictates the market is crushing older players and not evaluating them at all because they're just saying, well, he's old, so I don't care. Well, then those are players that I am going to look through and find the one or two guys that I believe might be buying opportunities. And in this class, that is Malik Washington, who is also small, and Ray Davis. And I'll also say this in the same context of buying opportunities. My most successful dynasty league over the last three years is a dynasty league where I went into the auction knowing that the teams around me were going to overpay for running backs compared to my board. And so I went fully on board with a zero RB strategy and I ended up with running backs like Gus Edwards, Leonard Fournette, and most importantly to this conversation, Raheem Mostert. Raheem Mostert is a guy who three years ago I got for nothing because he was too old. And not only has he been a good running back for three three years, but I am in trade negotiations trying to use Raheem Mostert to trade up in draft picks to get higher into the first round with other things, obviously, to get higher into the second round. Raheem Mostert has still trade value at almost 32 years old now because when you're playing and when you're good, it's just going to keep going. Now, do I think Ray Davis is going to be that guy? Most likely not, but I don't, I don't care about any age he gets to in his rookie contract. If this guy plays well under a rookie contract, they're going to let him play well for a rookie contract. Again, everything's a big if in these situations. He might end up going to a team that pays $40 million to Saquon Barkley this offseason. And then it's just, he's a backup and nothing else. But he could also go to that a, a team that's like that, but then the running back who's in front of him gets hurt, and he ends up being the guy for the whole season, and then he ends up impressing. You really don't know what's going to happen, and he has the three-down skill set, and that's the bottom line. He has the three-down skill set with the BMI, with the speed, with the power, with the pass-catching ability, that if he gets into one of these roles, I think he can do a really really good and consistent job with just a little bit of pop on top. So is Ray Davis a great running back prospect? No, he's not. And being a top five running back in this class for me does say something about how I view the 2024 running back class in terms of high upside fantasy running backs.
But at the end of the day, Ray Davis is a player who does so many things well, and I'm very excited about the fact that his age is causing people to dismiss him because I do think that the age should cause people to undervalue or lower the value on him, but it seems like it's causing him to be dismissed outright. And if that's what it takes to get me a value in a marketplace, I will take it up every single time. And so that's all I have for the show today. When I went over the wide receivers at the very end that weren't on any first rounds, I did put Troy Franklin with every other wide receiver. And while I am a little bit concerned with the combine, I didn't want to mislead people because that was probably an error. Troy Franklin is still somebody who I have as my wide receiver seven. I do still have A.D. Mitchell, Brian Thomas Jr., and Keon Coleman over Troy Franklin, but Troy Franklin is a clear wide receiver seven to me. And so Franklin is a lot more like Coleman than I probably let on in that segment. To where, as I said, if Coleman goes in the top 50, I'm probably willing to just take him over Worthy outright as long as Worthy goes at the very end of the first round. So to me, that's probably the same thing with Coleman and Franklin. One last closing thought I had on the whole Ray Davis thing is that I feel like in the fantasy world at this point, all of these big picture items that we discover become a little bit like a a, a game of telephone was the way I wrote it down. I don't know if that's the perfect analogy because obviously that is things getting wrong, but it's kind of like somebody hears over and over and over again, okay, age is a big deal, age is a big deal, age is a big deal. And then they get a ranking set from somebody who already thinks age is a big deal and has already adjusted all of their rankings for age. And then they get the rankings, then they look at them and they see a player and they go, oh, no, age is a big deal got to move them down well you the rankings that you got were already based on principles from a guy who probably already knocked a guy for age just like we talk about double counting in the combine double counting with negatives in prospect profiles is absolutely a thing as well and you see it all the time because of how many things are commonly said in fantasy football i think that is why the biggest actual advantage that you can consistently get is from and i know this is very general and broad from the ability to think about the marketplace critically because it's very easy to say well this is good this is bad but if everybody is working off the same information you have to know how good is good how much is good worth paying for that's that's the most important thing in a marketplace game and you have to you know think critically about a market to get there so to me ray davis the age is bad it's very bad it's very 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 bad but if the market is already treating it like it's 17 very bads and i only think it's two or three that's a buying opportunity I will have one more show this week, but don't expect a specific date right here. I will be adjusting my calendar based on NFL news. Next show will be the most heavy NFL show that I have ever done so far going into all the free agency news in detail. So until next time.